Welcome to the first presentation in the series entitled God's Temple of Truth. This presentation is entitled The Critical Component. God's Temple of Truth is a series about the sanctuary of God, about the tabernacle of Moses, the, the, that layout of that, that sort of square oblong thing that Moses built in the wilderness. Well, that rectangular structure that the Lord gave to the, the plans of to Moses, that's what we're going to be studying in the next uh, couple of presentations. And we're going to be looking at various levels of the sanctuary and how it pertained to Old Testament Jerusalem, but also how it pertains to the church today on earth, Christianity today, but also how it pertained to the first church. In this presentation entitled The Critical Component, we're going to be looking at how the sanctuary itself might actually be quite an important element of Christian worship. Let me start off with a statement entitled Truth. Truth is independent of opinion. Truth is also intolerant of error. Every aspect of a truthful message stimulates the conscience and requests acknowledgement. The individual, however, holds the key to accept or reject that message. So, truth itself, it doesn't matter what you think and it doesn't matter what I think. Truth remains truth. If it's truth, you can't find any error in it. And not only that, when you hear a truthful message, your conscience is stimulated to request or, or to acknowledge the message of truth. But you and I, we can override the will of God by our free will. That's the only thing that the Lord allows or, or will not override is our free will. So you and I have the choice whether to accept or reject that message. Let's go and read Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23 together. It says there, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord. Just stop for a moment. Who's speaking here in Matthew 7? Well, if you have a Bible that has the red writing, like, like this Bible, if you have red writing, you see that the words there is Jesus himself. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, in other words, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. What Jesus is saying here is, not everyone who calls me Lord, Lord. Now who calls Jesus Lord? It's the Christians, right? So Matthew 7, 21 clearly says, not everyone that calls Jesus Lord. In other words, not every Christian will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they that do the will of the Father. Let's read on. Many will say to me, Jesus speaking, in that day, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we not cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? These are miracles. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. This is a reference to the group of people where the Lord says, uh, 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 you aren't allowed into the kingdom of heaven. And they say, but Lord, have we not prophesied and cast out demons and done miracles in your name? And he says, I never knew you. Meaning, while you were busy doing that, I wasn't the power behind it. You see, Jesus' disciples come to him and say to him, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the world? The first thing Jesus says is, be careful that no man deceives you. And, uh, the, the key element at the end of time, Satan's greatest attack on God's people will be deception, deception, deception. So let's put a scenario together. We have seven theologians discussing a Bible theme. We have seven theologians sitting around a table and they've chosen a specific Bible theme. I, whatever. It could be what happens when you die or speaking in tongues or woman's ordination, whatever it is, right? Seven theologians, have a look. You've got 
uh, and I'm just choosing seven that uh, are quite regularly found in South Africa. The Achies, the Apostolic Faith Mission, the Neapostolics, the Enchekak, the Pentecostals, the Anglicans, the Methodists, the Lutherans. You can have 25 people, theologians, sitting around the table, but let's stick to seven at the moment. Seven theologians from different denominations sitting around the table discussing a Bible theme. Question. How many interpretations will you have of that one biblical theme? Say, for example, you wrote to choose speaking in tongues. Around that table, how many biblical interpret or how many uh, interpretations would you have of that one biblical theme? You'd have seven. Right? You, uh, you might even have more than seven because one person might say to you, well, it could mean this or it co possibly could mean that. So from those seven theologians sitting around the table, you might have more uh, uh, than seven interpretations. Is, is that a problem? Do you think that's a problem? Well, question two. How many interpretations should there be of that one scripture? What would your answer be? One. So, can you see question three? Is there a problem? Yes, of course there's a problem. Sitting around the table, they all are people believing in the Bible. All of them believe in Jesus Christ. But yet, all of them have got different perspectives on biblical themes. Can you see that there's a problem? This is why Christianity is in, in, in separate sections and different areas, different people believing different things. You see, the, where the different ideas or interpretations come from is the following. Each person around that table is filtering the information through their understanding, their experience, or their conviction. What do I mean? Say, for example, we take the Enchia person who has never spoken in tongues before. And you, uh, that person would, would say to you, well, according to the Bible, their understanding is that uh, speaking in tongues is demonic, right? It's, it's not from God. Then you speak to a Pentecostal who's experienced it, and that person will say, well, uh, you, 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 when you do it, you just know it's from God. Absolutely know it's from God. So just those two theologians, right? They are, read it again. Each person around the table is filtering the information through their understanding, experience and conviction. So whatever the person has experienced and been convicted on in their understanding, that becomes the interpretation filter of that biblical theme. This produces completely different and often contradictory interpretations of the same thing. Just like one person that has spoken in tongues versus one person that hasn't spoken in tongues, these two people, because of their filter, which is their experience, they come up with two different solutions. Can you see what I'm saying with this? My question that we need to ask then is, we have this problem around the table. What do you think is needed to solve the problem? What do we need? Maybe I should ask you, who do we need? Who would the solution be to the answer, the, the seven people sitting around a table discussing a Bible theme, all of them have got their own interpretations. Who would we need to solve the problem? What happens if Jesus was to walk through the door and they said, have a seat, Lord. Uh, will you tell us, please? Will you tell us, what does it mean when the Bible says the following? Having Jesus at the table would solve the problem. Does that make sense? All of those theologians would submit, hopefully, to Jesus' interpretation. So the answer to my question, what is needed, is Jesus' personal interpretation is what's needed. If I could somehow today find out what Jesus' interpretation is of Scripture, then I know that uh, if, and by the way, it, it won't be embedded in a church. It, it won't be, well, the New Apostolics or the, the Enchias or the Archies or so and so says. No, it will be some external factor, like having Jesus at the table, an external factor that will give light to all of those sitting around the table. We need Jesus, His personal interpretation. So then the question would be, how does one then find out what Jesus' interpretation would have been. 
My answer is easy. We have to use the same template as Jesus used. What do I mean by template? Well, Jesus physically is not sitting at the table with those seven theologians. So what do we need? We need a template or a stencil. or We need to find out what Jesus' filter was. And then if we apply the same, it'll make sense. Well, let me give you a picture to maybe explain what I mean. Here, as you can see on this graphic, is a stencil with the word fragile on it. If I had a, a can of spray paint and I wanted to write on the wall, fragile, right? I wrote it against the wall and then I moved a meter to the side and I wrote it again. That fragile and this fragile, would they be the same? No. Obviously they would be different because of the slight change in my hand movement. If I wanted to make sure that I wrote fragile a thousand times and every time it came out the same, I would need a, a stencil or a template. So I would literally put the stencil there and I go and I would come out with the same, does that make sense? It would be the same product or the outcome would be the same and every time I do it. So the, the stencil or the template that you use for what you're trying to get, that's the critical element. The paint is important, the wall is important, the person doing it is important, but the stencil is the key between having a mess and having structure. Now, let me make it even clearer. Say for example, I want to <coughs> take a photograph of this pot plant over here, right? I'm standing over here and I want to take a, or, or uh, let, let me use an example even better. I'm taking a photograph of a mountain. I'm standing in Cape Town at, uh, up on um, somewhere Belleville or uh, at Bloberg Strand. I'm standing there and I want to take a picture of the mountain. I take a camera like this one. It's called an SLR, a single lens reflex camera. All that, that's fancy wording for you can take the lens out and put in a different lens. Now you can see the lens on that camera is a zoom lens. It's a very long lens, right? So now I pick up my camera and I, I look at Table Mountain and I go, right? I take my photograph. I then take out, take out the long lens and put in a short lens. I turn back, the same cameraman, the same camera, the same um, uh, source of information. With a short lens, I take another photograph and then I print these two photographs and I look at them. Question. Will these two photographs be the same, yes or no? No, they'll be different. What's changed? What's the difference? The, as I explained, Table Mountain stays the same, the person taking the photograph stays the same, the body stays the same, but it's the lens or the filter that you use which changes. Does it make sense? And the picture that you take changes according to the filter or the lens that you use. Now we've got seven theologians sitting around a table. All of them are taking pictures of the same spiritual pictures obviously, of the same biblical information. But all of them have got their own filters, their own lenses, their personal experiences. So they're all coming up with different pictures. And what we need to find out is what lens would Jesus have used? Let's go back to the graphic. Right? That guy at the back there is what I call Jesus. The, the body of the camera doesn't change. The lens changes, yes, but the constant between all of those theologians is Jesus Christ. The lens, however, is what I call the critical component. The lens changes the photograph. It doesn't change the source material and it doesn't change the person. But the lens changes the product of what you are busy photographing. In the same way, I want to take you uh, into the, the thinking of Jesus. Because we need to find out what lens he would have used, what template he would have used. If Jesus sat at the table and spiritually he took out his spiritual camera 
and took a picture of that biblical theme, what lens would he have used? Because if we can take his lens and put it into all of those seven theologians' cameras, they would all come up with the same picture. Can you get that? Well, as an evangelist, I travel all over the world. And this image shows what I sometimes feel like. I feel like a, a little boy with a little pebble in his hand, a stone, that's trying to throw the stone at this tank, at this armored vehicle. An absolute impossible task to damage the enemy. Well, that's until I look into the sanctuary. You see, when I look into the sanctuary, it's like... You're up against this phenomenal satanic force in the world, trying to stop the outreach of the gospel. But when you look into the sanctuary, instead of taking a pebble out of my pocket, I take a nuclear grenade and I literally can uh, 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 vaporize false doctrines and the false beliefs embedded in God's churches and God's church by Satan himself. As Malachi 3 verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I have young children, and many of you watching I'm sure have young children as well. As you will know, children are inquisitive. Right? They bubbly and they run around and they, they're constantly busy and you sometimes wish there was just a mute button. Right? But, but uh, what do you think is the most uh, difficult question that a child has for his parents? Have you noticed the question that keeps on coming back in Afrikaans? It's hukum. In English it's why. Go wash your hands. Why? Because they're dirty. Why? Because you were playing in the mud. Why? Because you enjoy it. Why? I don't know why. Just go wash your hands. Have you noticed that as parents? Right? That why question, it digs deep, 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 deep until we actually don't know why ourselves. But there must be a reason why. Well, the sanctuary answers all the why questions. When you look into the tabernacle of God, this picture there on the right hand side, when, when you look into the tabernacle of God, the tabernacle answers all those why questions. It is the one solution. When you're looking for the filter of the Lord, we, we, we have to find out what Jesus' filter would have been, what His template would have been. And I believe that through the next couple of presentations, it will become clear that this is possibly Jesus' filter, Jesus' lens. That he used. Moses is called to negotiate, negotiate Israel's freedom. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses from the middle of the bush and the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So here is a commission given to Moses. Go and call from Pharaoh Israel to come out of Egypt, my afflicted people. I, I, Moses goes about his business. He pre uh, prepares Israel to leave. Eventually after the, the uh, plagues, etc., Israel leaves. They meet the Lord at Mount Sinai and then the Lord calls Moses into Mount Sinai to speak to him face to face. Exodus 24. So Moses went into the middle of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. There he was in the cloud in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. What do you think he went there to do? Why did the Lord call him? Please notice the text where this is coming from. Exodus 24. Now, if you go and study Exodus 24, from Exodus 25 onwards, the Lord starts explaining something to Moses. He says, Moses, you've now called my people Israel out of Egypt 
And now I want you to go and do something. I want you to go back down to Israel and here's the shopping list. Here's a shopping list. Go and fetch the following items from them as free will offerings because we're going to do something special, right? Exodus 25. Speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering, a free will offering. And this is the offering which you shall take from them. Gold, silver and bronze, blue, purple and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins and acacia wood. I also need oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. So here we have a situation, right? Here we have Moses being called by God into Mount Sinai. And the Lord says to him, I want you to go back down to Israel and get this shopping list, right? This is what I need you to go and fetch. As a child of the Lord, what do you think Moses would say? Okay, bye. Let me go and fetch it. I'm sure part of his discussion, his face-to-face, with, face-to-face discussion with the Lord would have been, Okay, Lord, uh, I'll, go and, I'll, I'll go and fetch your stuff, but can you please tell me what was that question? Why? Just, just explain to me, why, Lord? Why do you want me to go and fetch all of these items from Israel? He explains to Moses, Let them make me a sanctuary according to all that I show you, that is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so shall you make it. I want you to go and and build me a sanctuary. That question again, uh, why a sanctuary, Lord? Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Can you see it? Right, can you see? So, The Lord says, right, come speak to me, Moses. Moses goes into the mountain and 40 days and 40 nights, Moses is in discussion with the Lord. He says, I want you to go and fetch the stuff from the people. They said, okay, Lord, uh, uh, why? What do you want? Let them go and build me a sanctuary. Okay, Lord, why do you want a sanctuary? That I may dwell among my people. Oh, okay, Lord, no problem. And uh, as we know, the rest is history. But can you see how the why question is the question which gives the Lord the opportunity to give us more information? The Lord says to Moses that I want you to see that you make it according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Now that means that while Moses was on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, the Lord must have shown him something. He must have shown him some sort of sanctuary or tabernacle and he says I want you to go and make it according to the layout according to the template that I showed you when you were on the mountain right now it also says in Acts 7 that our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen the patterns of the things in the heavens the holy places made with hands this word there is tabneeth right? This is a structure, a model, or a resemblance of the original. So when Moses is in in the mount, the Lord shows him the original sanctuary, which is obviously in heaven, and he says, I want you to go and build me a little dinky model, like a dinky car is a small version of the the big Mercedes or the big Porsche, and you've got the little dinky car. Well, what Moses is told to do, go and build me a a little dinky version of the real thing that exists in heaven. Now that was in Exodus 25 we saw just now. Go and fetch me this shopping list, right? Go and fetch me the stuff. Okay, Lord, um, you want me to build you a sanctuary? Yes, please. How is this sanctuary going to be made, Lord? You know, when the Lord... Uh, give certain information in the Bible, I think it's quite important to listen to what's there. But when he gives you lots of information and repeated information, I think it's not just wasting space in the Bible. There might be a reason for it. And for six chapters, the Lord explains to Moses how to build the sanctuary. This was a basic or is a basic diagram of the layout of the sanctuary. You can see there was one door 
and uh, you had the altar of sacrifice behind the door, you had the, uh, the laver of washing behind that, then you had the five pillared veil into the holy place. Interesting, you had three items in the holy place which we'll get into just now. The table of showbread, uh, the, uh, the um, candlesticks over there which symbolizes the light of the world. And Jesus, didn't He say, I'm the bread of life, the table of showbread? And then there at the veil, the f this is the veil into the most holy, just before the veil. And there before the most holy, thereabouts there, is something called the altar of incense. Now these items will become clearer and what they mean and what they symbolize. But this simple little diagram is probably and possibly I believe the most in-depth and most misunderstood or not understood uh, um, template of all time. Interesting to note that uh, the, the, everything happened here from east to west. The, the tabernacle was laid out from east to west and the sinner would walk in with the lamb, the lamb would be sacrificed on the altar, the priest would use the laver of washing to go into the holy place to go and sprinkle the blood on the, the veil and on the horns of the, the uh, altar of incense. But there's some specific things I want you to notice here. As I say, you've got the door to enter, then the altar of sacrifice behind that, the labor of washing. The altar of incense, please notice, I beg your pardon, the altar of sacrifice or the altar of offering, please notice that it's open on three sides and closed on three sides and open on one side. That'll become clear in the next couple of presentations. The laver of washing is two layers. It's a top layer and a bottom layer. The water poured from the top layer into the bottom layer. And it was so specific, the Lord said, the priest cannot wash his hands in the water. He has to scoop the water and wash his hands outside, making sure that no defilement went in there. The, the hands and the feet had to be washed top and bottom before he could enter into the holy place. The, the laver of washing, also for interest's sake, you'll see in the diagram as I show you here, that the laver of washing is slightly offset to the one side, right? The reason for that is because it says in 1 Kings 7, He set the sea, which is the laver, to the right side of the house towards the southeast. Now, uh, this is the north. What's going on? Well, we as Westerners, we our thinking is left to right. If I ever have the opportunity to present this series to the uh, Arab nations and uh, other, other nations that read from right to left, I'll turn it around and I'll show from right to left. But we as Westerners think always left to right. So I've turned the sanctuary this way so that because everything starts at the door and works towards the most holy, we have east on this side and west on that side. So that's why when it says he set it on the right side of the house towards the southeast, this looking from this door outwards, it would be the southeast side of the temple. Okay, so let's continue. As you walked through the sanctuary and you got past the altar of uh, sacrifice, past the laver, you went into the holy place. Now inside the holy place there were three items. You had the table of showbread. This was six layers of bread in two piles, one on top of the other. Didn't someone somewhere sometimes say, I'm the bread of life? Well, the table of showbread points towards Jesus, but he also said, uh, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So the bread symbolizes Jesus, but also the word. Didn't it somewhere say that the word became flesh? And today we have the Word of God in the Bible. So, table of showbread symbolizing in physical form a spiritual fulfillment. Two other items in the holy place. You have the uh, altar of incense over there, which uh, symbolized the prayers of God's people going up and over the veil into the most holy. You have the golden candlestick over there, symbolizing the spreading of the gospel, the sharing of the light. Uh, by the way, who's the mediator? Who's the intercessor? Who's the one that carries your prayers to the throne? That's Jesus. Who said, I am the light of the world? Jesus said that. So 
the, in the holy place, the, the table of showbread points to Jesus. The altar of incense points to Jesus. The, the menorah, the candlesticks points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. If you go through the holy into the most holy, there you had some interesting things. At the bottom you had the Ark of the Covenant with the solid gold mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. Inside it you had the law. Firstly, you had the Ten Commandments. You also had the pot of manna and Aaron's rod. Three different things that were inside the Ark of the Covenant. Above the Ark of the Covenant, there between these two what are called covering cherubs, you have the Shekinah glory. Now this, brothers and sisters, was literally the presence of God. The God when God Himself came into the temple, He was in the Pre, in the, his presence was the Shekinah glory. You see, the sanctuary is always where God meets His people. There I will meet with the children of Israel, and the tabernacle will be sanctified by my glory. And I will dwell among the children of Israel, and I will be their God. Uh, let them uh, get those things together for me. Why, Lord, that, I can build them, that you can build me a sanctuary? Why a sanctuary, Lord, that I may dwell among them? And here the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle. And what does it say? I will dwell among the children of Israel and be their God. So that Shekinah glory, that light, that bright light, the light of the world there in the west, that was the very presence of God. As it says in Ezekiel 37, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them. Uh, excuse me? For, what does it mean the sanctuary will be in the midst of them forevermore? I don't understand. Well, what, did, what was Jesus called? Wasn't He called Emmanuel? God with us? I'll get to this in the next couple of presentations. It'll become clearer. Exodus 25. Thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. And there, listen now, I will meet with thee. <clears throat> and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony, all of all things which I give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So here the Lord says, my throne on earth is going to be there between those two cherubims above the mercy seat, above the ark of the covenant, called the Shekinah glory, the very presence of God. Now the symbolism in the sanctuary or in the tabernacle is much deeper than just on a physical level. It has tremendous prophetic symbolism as well. Let me give you an example. Psalm 73 tells us, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled and my steps had nearly slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You see, the psalmist is saying here, when he saw the drug lords and he saw the thieves and the fraudsters, he saw that they were driving the big BMWs and they were flying the Learjets and having the Armani suits. His feet almost slipped. What does it say then? Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I, their end, the end of the wicked. Uh, excuse me, where in the sanctuary do you see the end of the wicked? Well, it's quite easy. Go back to the sanctuary and you'll see when a sinner walks in or a person walks in the door, what's the first thing that they see? Obviously, they see the priest and the lamb. But notice that the, the, the uh, altar of offering was closed on three sides and was open in front. And the reason for that is that as you walked in, the first thing that you would see there would be the end of the wicked, the result of the hellfire, ashes. So the, even, even from that perspective, the sanctuary is a dramatized parable of God's dealings with men. To study the sanctuary is to think God's thoughts after Him, to understand in its every detail is to realize to some extent the depth of his wisdom. The sanctuary, brothers and sisters, is the parable. It is the business plan of God's dealings with men. It is the business plan of salvation. And to study this business plan, to study the sanctuary, is to literally get some insight into the depth and the extent of the wisdom of God. J.L. Schuler wrote it so clearly. He said, 
There is no other work, look at that, no other work, subject, which so fully unites all part of the Bible, the sacred volume, into one harmonious whole as this subject of the sanctuary. Listen to this challenge now. Every gospel truth centers in the sanctuary service. Wow! Does that mean we can find communion in the sanctuary? Does that mean we can find Jesus' birth in the sanctuary? Can we find Jesus' death? In, can we find His ascension into this, in the sanctuary? Um, can we find uh, speaking in tongues in the sanctuary? Can we, okay. The challenge here, read it again. Every gospel truth centers in the sanctuary service. So if you understand the sanctuary through the lens or the filter of, that, uh, of Jesus, the sanctuary system, God amongst His people, Every gospel truth should be able to be found in there. Now that's quite a serious challenge. And we're going to test this in the next presentations. We're going to test this in depth. My question is, do we in the, new, in the 21st century need to understand the sanctuary? Wasn't it just for the Jews? Well, this is the problem and this is the question. Wasn't the sanctuary just given for the Jews? Well, to, to understand that, we need to understand something called a type and an antitype. Baker's Dictionary of Theology explains that a type is a shadow cast on the pages of the Old Testament history by who, a truth whose full embodiment or antitype is found in the New Testament revelation. So a type and an antitype, these are two elements. A type is in the Old Testament. It's fulfilled in the New Testament Antitype. Let me give you an example. The next day John the Baptist uh, saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. Okay, here comes Jesus down to the sea, uh, down to the river at least, where John the Baptist, Baptist is baptizing people. And John the Baptist says, oh, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Um, did Jesus look like a sheep? No. So how did John the Baptist know to call Jesus the Lamb? Well, to understand that, we need to go back to the sanctuary. We need to go and look at the sanctuary and understand. It says in Exodus, In the tenth day, take for yourself a lamb without blemish. On the fourteenth day, Israel will kill this lamb at twilight in the late afternoon. It is the Lord's Passover. You shall not break one of its bones. Very interesting. Here's the Passover lamb going to be sacrificed. And the Lord says, right, do, 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 do. these are the requirements of the lamb. Please note, have a look here, right? This is the type, the lamb of God that's without blemish that was killed at twilight, the Passover. Number one, it's a lamb. Number two, it is without blemish. Number three, it is killed at twilight. Number four, it's called the Lord's Passover. And number four, no bones are allowed to be broken. Very interesting. No bones are allowed to be broken. Have a look. Right. Here we have the same characteristics. Uh, John the Baptist said in John 1 verse 29, the next day John saw Jesus and John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Question. Do we have a correlation between these two? Absolutely. What about number 2? 1 Peter 1.19 says, Christ without blemish and without spot. Perfect parallel. That's in place. What about He's killed at twilight? About the ninth hour, late in the afternoon, 3 o'clock, Jesus yielded up the ghost. He's killed at twilight. Number 4 is the Lord's Passover. Didn't Paul write in 1 Corinthians 5, For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Perfect parallel. Don't break any of His bones. The soldiers came to Jesus and they did not break His legs. They came to all the others, brothers and sisters, but they don't break any of Jesus' bones. Do we have a parallel there? Yes or no? Can you see in the Old Testament type, how Jesus becomes the New Testament fulfillment antitype. Two words I want you to remember. What were they? Type and antitype. Have a look at the graphic. Surely He, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. And with His stripes we are healed. 
He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. So he, Jesus, opening not his mouth. There we have the lamb. And Jesus becomes the anti-type lamb. Surely he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, brothers and sisters. Jesus is the anti-typical lamb with a capital L. Can you see the type and anti-type? Well, there in the sanctuary, there in the outer court, Jesus becomes the Lamb. Type meets anti-type. The cross meets the sacrifice. Now, this picture that you saw just now is going to become more and more important and clearer and clearer through this series. The sanctuary was given for the sole purpose of revealing Jesus Christ. It is a complete revelation of the gospel of salvation. The message of the sanctuary was not only given to the Hebrew nation, but it is given to every nation, kindred, tongue and people to the very end of time. So this idea of uh, that it just belongs to the Jews or just belongs to the, the, the white people or the colored people or the this people or that people, we need to be careful because it's called the everlasting gospel. You see, this message reaches its climax through the magnificent exclamation of the everlasting gospel. That's what we'll be looking at in our next presentation, the everlasting gospel. But on the road to Emmaus, uh, Cleopas and his friend is walking towards Emmaus. And there something happens. Let's read together what happens. He, Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into His glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. Cleopas and his friend are walking to Emmaus. And they are mourning, they are upset, they are sad, they are angry because of the events in Jerusalem over the weekend. Jesus has died and it is the third day. And Jesus comes near to them and they don't recognize Him. They don't see that it's Jesus. They can't see it's Him. Can't rec don't, don't recognize Him. And uh, <clears throat> they, say to, uh, they, they uh, say to the Lord, uh, uh, don't you, haven't you heard what's going on? And He says, what things? What's been going on? And they start telling Him about Jesus, the greatest of all the prophets. And He says, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, or oh, in all that the prophets have spoken. Let's read it again. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things to enter into His glory? Now listen. And beginning at Moses, starting with the sanctuary and all the prophets, Jesus expanded, expounded or explained to them in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. In order for Jesus to explain to the people in the New Testament about Himself, he starts with a sanctuary. He goes back to the sanctuary and he says, uh, let me draw you a picture, right? Let me explain to you the sanctuary and how I, the Christ, ought to have suffered these things to enter into my glory. In the Old Testament, you have God amongst his people, right? Didn't Jesus fulfill the same on earth when he was here? Let's have a look. Isaiah tells us, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. The New Testament fulfillment is, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is what? God with us. Yes, brothers and sisters, the Old Testament, the sanctuary, God with his people. The New, uh, the New Testament, Emmanuel, God with His people. What about the new earth? Let's read what it says in Revelation 21, right? Verse 3. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with Him. What, what do you mean the tabernacle of God is with men? Are we going to go back to the Old Testament sanctuary? Are we going to go back to the temple of Moses? Are we going to go back to slaughtering sheep? I don't understand, Lord. What do you mean? Explain. Let's read on. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And He, the tabernacle, He, Jesus, will dwell with them and they shall be His people and God Himself shall be with them and be their God. You see, 
And there's no change between the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the, the New Jerusalem brothers and sisters. Jesus, did He not say, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world? Jesus in the Old Testament was God with us. Jesus, Emmanuel in the New Testament is God with us. And on the new earth, Jesus, the tabernacle of God, is with men. And He, Jesus, Emmanuel, will be God amongst His people again. Can you see how this, this, the, the entire um, system of the plan of salvation is unified in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters? J. E. Fulton says, At no point does Satan seek to obscure our vision and confuse our minds more than in the sanctuary. At no point the highest form of attack on Christianity today is the sanctuary. You'll notice through these presentations how we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the sanctuary, brothers and sisters, and how you will see that the sanctuary is, has been covered up and it's not being taught anymore, especially how it pertains to Christianity. And yet the psalmist says in Psalm 134 verse 2, Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in the firmament of His power. Brothers and sisters, the sanctuary is not something to be toyed with. That little dinky version of the real one up in heaven, that, my brothers and sisters, is the plan of salvation laid out in such a way that simple people like you and I can understand it. Unless we become like little children, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You see the, the beauty, and it will become clear in the next couple of presentations, how the Lord says, and even in Corinthians, Paul says that it is the simplicity which is in Christ. The plan of salvation, those, those four walls and the little things inside, that simple business plan is actually the most phenomenal plan of salvation laid out for us to understand. And that's why the psalmist could say in Psalm 77 verse 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. You see, whether it's the Old Testament psalmist, that's uh, saying, oh, my feet almost slipped when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And I thought, oh, maybe I should go into whatever, drug dealing or prostitution or whatever. Maybe I should go into that. Until I went into the sanctuary of God and there I understood the end of the wicked. I could see the ash under the altar. Then I, I got it. I could it snap. So thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Whether it's the Old Testament psalmist, whether it's before that, Moses, brothers and sisters, or whether it's today, seven theologians sitting around a table discussing a Bible theme. Different points of view, different perspectives, different experiences, different beliefs. All of them believe in Jesus Christ. All of them believe that the Bible is God's Word. Why then do we have so many different options? Because we're not using the template or the filter that Jesus used. Seven theologians sitting around a table, all taking spiritual photographs of the same information and coming up with different interpretations. I think it's time that we need to put the critical component in place. We all believe in Jesus. We've all got the same body of our camera. But brothers and sisters, if you and I have different filters, different lenses for our spiritual cameras, we will come up with different interpretations. Surely it's time for us to go back to Jesus and say, Lord, did you use a, an 80 to 200 zoom lens? Did you use a ma macro lens? Did you use a, a fisheye lens? Did you use an ultra zoom uh, 500? Or what did you use, Lord? Obviously, spiritually speaking. Give us the exact example of what lens you used when you study the Bible, when you read the Bible, when you teach the Bible. Lord, I want to put that lens, that filter into my personal experience. And then I can assure you, brothers and sisters, you and I 
will come up with the same pictures of the plan of salvation. And what happens if, uh, say for example, we have an experience, an experience where the door breaks open, or the door opens, let's not say it's too, too dramatically, the door opens, or here in the room appears next to you an angel of light. And this angel is telling you and teaching you certain things. How do you know if that angel is from God or not? The Bible says, and Satan himself is changed into an angel of light. How do I know that the information that angel is telling me is from the Lord or not? If your experience and your conviction is going to be your filter of truth, then you will not be able to determine if that's truth or not. But if you can evaluate even an angel through a different lens, you'll be able to expose that angel. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 1. But though we, or even an angel from heaven, preaches any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Paul had preached a gospel to the, the Christian church, was preaching a gospel to the Christian church, and said, if someone comes along, if I come back to you and preach a different gospel to you, or if an angel appears in your midst and preaches a different gospel to you, you need to be able to test me, test the angel, and make sure that we're living and preaching correctly according to the word of God. Brothers and sisters, read that again. But though we or an angel from heaven preach to you any other gospel, let him be accursed. How are we as Christians going to stand if Satan turns himself into an angel of light at the end of time? I believe it's through the power of the sanctuary. We've got some fantastic information lined up for you. And I hope you're going to come back to study the temple. Because as it was written in Psalm 29 verse 9, and in his temple, all of it is saying glory. All of the temple, all of the tabernacle of God is calling out glory to God in the highest. The sanctuary of God is truly the critical component. In the next presentation, we're going to be looking at the everlasting gospel, how Christ and the message of the sanctuary unify into this eternal gospel. I hope I'll see you in the next presentation. Thank you.